Uh, This week I came across a picture, I'm going to put it up here, Uh, many of you have probably seen this before, uh, but it's a picture of a man with a parachute and his parachute is engulfed in flames. And when I saw this picture, I had two thoughts. The first thought is, he's in trouble, he is in big trouble. And the second thought I had is, how did he get here? How did this happen? Like, how do you get to a point where your parachute is engulfed in flames? And when we look at 1 Samuel 18, what we're going to see is that King Saul is in big trouble. It is as if his parachute is engulfed in flames. And the natural question is, how does he get here? How does Saul get to this point? Because at one point, Saul was a relatively humble man. He was the son of Kish, watching donkeys with his family, and then he becomes king. One day he becomes king over Israel, and he has some success. God uses him to do a variety of things for his name's sake. But by chapter 18, he's going down in a ball of flames. And so how does he get this get to this point? Well, tonight we're going to study how Saul lights his parachute on fire. This is what we're going to see. And there are two overarching ideas I want to consider with you here uh, this evening. The first is the jealousy of Saul. This is what is clear. Chapter 18 is all about the jealousy of Saul. And the second is the cure for jealousy. How do we solve the problem of jealousy? So let's start with the jealousy of Saul. Uh, After David killed Goliath, what we see is that David does not go home, but rather he's made a military commander, a leader, and he is leading the special forces into battle, and they have some additional success against the Philistine army. And then, after a certain point, they come home, and verse 6 says this, as the troops were coming back, when David was returning from killing the Philistine, the women came out from all the cities of Israel to meet King Saul singing and dancing with tambourines, with shouts of joy, and with three-stringed instruments. And so the celebration begins. There's, there's this picture of incredible celebration throughout these Israelite cities. And this, this is naturally what would happen. If you think about what has been happening in the nation of Israel, that for 40 days and for 40 nights, Goliath had come out and faced the Israelite army, and he taunted God in the army. And each day, the Israelites backed down. Each day they were filled with more and more fear. The reality of being outmatched was becoming more and more clear. And so as each day passed by, the hearts of the troops were filled with more and more terror, so the hearts of the Israelite cities were filled with more and more terror. Then one day there is some good news. And the good news is that Israel has killed Goliath and they are crushing the Philistines. And so the natural question everyone is wondering is, who killed Goliath? Who is it that took down the giant? And the answer is David, the eighth son of Jesse, a shepherd boy. And naturally, word would have spread. Everyone would have been hearing about David, and and everyone would would have been asking, who is he? What do we know about him? And so his fame begins to spread. And David was a quite impressive young man. It says he was handsome, he had great looking eyes, he was young, and he was courageous. Last week we saw in chapter 17, this is what it says. This is David's answer to Saul, which is a picture of his spirit. It says in verse 34, David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab its fur, by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now this is one of these these passages that I don't know if I want my wife to read, uh, because she might say, Dan, if this is what a man is, then what are you? I mean, what are you really? I mean, look at this man. This is insane. This is insane. He, he would take a lion or a bear and he would kill it with his bare hands. And he was also humble. He, wasn't, he was not obnoxious and boisterous. He was a humble man. How do we know that? Well, he says here, it was the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the bear. And he will rescue me from the giant. And so David knew he was outmatched against the lion and the bear and the giant. He was dependent on the Lord. He wasn't looking to his own strength, but the strength of the Lord. And he actually killed Goliath. Then he becomes a great leader. He's going to become incredibly rich. 
He's a musician, he's a poet, he's devoted to God, not to mention he wrote a lot of the Bible, or he will write much of the Bible. Now, how many of you single ladies would like to meet single David? Just raise your, how many of you would like to, okay, there's a few honest ladies here tonight, okay. <laughs> Everyone wants to meet David. <laughs> if you guys raise their hands too, that's great. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's not hard to imagine this celebration. It's not hard to imagine the cities going berserk because they're free, their security, their strength. Everyone is happy because they've won. And it's not hard to imagine David getting special attention. David is, he is at the center of what God is doing. And so all the ladies are dressed to impress, their perfume is on, they have their makeup done, their hair up or whatever, they are dressed to party. And they have written a song. They've written a song. And this song has spread all over the place. This is the song, the picture here is that this isn't just some little isolated song where three ladies are singing it, but this is the song of the celebration. Verse seven, as they danced, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And so you see Saul there. He, you, you can envision Saul celebrating, we won, we won, we won, and then he hears the song. And there's one little word in the song that changes everything. Do you see the word? There's one word in the song that changes everything. It's the word tens. Tens. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. His response? Saul was furious and resented this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credited me with thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. And so it is at this point that jealousy and envy ignites the parachute of Saul. He lights it on fire. And what we're going to see is that that fire is going to spread and it is going to cause his downfall. Now in Hebrew, the word kana, it is translated jealousy 15 times. And the same word kana is also translated envy 14 times. And so what you see in the Hebrew mind is that the word kana, it captures both jealousy and envy. It means both things. In English, it's a synonym. There are differences, but in Hebrew, it is the same exact idea. This word kana means both. Now, what does jealousy and envy do in our lives? Well, it lights our parachutes on fire. That's what it will do to you. It will light your parachute on fire. It will put you in a situation that is really, really bad. And what I want to do is just highlight three truths about jealousy and envy that we see in Saul's life. And these are designed to be reasons that you are to obey the biblical command to make war against them. That's what I hope. I hope that you, you will, as we go through this, your soul will decide to make war against jealousy, war against envy. And there is so much more I could say. I feel like my soul is filled with all kinds of verses and passages and examples, but they're not from the text. So we're going to try to limit what we're doing to the passage before us. So here are three truths about, na- about the nature of jealousy and envy. Number one is that jealousy and envy fuels competition. What does it do? It fuels competition, verse 8. Saul was furious and resented this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credited me with thousands. And so here in the song, David has become the rival of Saul. David doesn't know the competition has begun, but it has begun. And I did a little thought experiment this week. I thought, what, what if the song was this? Here's the song. Saul has killed his thousands. That's it. That's the, that, that's the song. Saul has killed his thousands. Saul has killed his thousands. Saul has killed, or whatever, however they would have sang the song. But this is the song. How would Saul react? Likely he would say this is the greatest song in the history of songs. This is the best thing ever. Just keep playing it, play it, play it all over every radio station possible. Or what if it was Saul has killed his thousands, but David has only killed several hundred? Doesn't have a good ring to it, I don't think. (laughs) But Saul would say even better even better. But what about Saul has killed his tens of thousands, so now he's getting credited with tens of thousands, but David his hundreds of thousands. Would he be happy? The answer is no way, 
Because the issue is not what David has. It's not the credit he receives. The issue is that David is being credited more than he. That that he is getting less credit than David. So he is losing the competition to David in his mind. The crowds, the ladies are saying David is more successful than Saul. David has more likes on Instagram than Saul. He has more views on YouTube than Saul. And Saul cannot handle it. It is driving him berserk. David's fame is greater than Saul's fame. And I want to be crystal clear about something. I am not saying that all competition is inherently wrong. And this is very important. That's not what the scriptures teach. It's not saying all competition is inherently wrong, but competition is often fueled by jealousy and envy. That's the driving energy behind it. It is a desire to be better than others, a desire to be above others. And it is competition that often brings the very worst out in people's lives. And if you don't believe me, just watch a church league basketball game. I mean, just watch it. It is insane what happens with Christians in church league basketball. I had to stop playing like 15 years ago because every time I played, I nearly lost my salvation. I mean, it was an utter (laughs) disaster. Like, what would happen to my soul? I thought, why do I feel like this? Why do I think this way? And it's because I couldn't handle the idea of these other people being better than me at basketball. And in the same way, Saul can't handle the idea of people thinking David is better than he is. David has gotten more credit, and it's driving him mad. Now, we do not compete in every area of life. You don't compare and compete in every area of life, but when you do, you want to win. You want to win. And so this is the way that it plays out. This is the pathway in our soul, is that If we perceive, if you perceive you're winning, that leads to arrogance. If you think you're winning in life, it naturally leads to arrogance, that you puff yourself up. But if you perceive that you're losing in life, that leads to envy. Envy is nothing more than wounded pride. It It is finding yourself on the losing side of the competition. And all day long, we compare ourselves, and all day long, we compete, not in every area, but in certain areas. We compare our spouses, our kids, our houses, our cars, our financial status. We compare that with other people. We compare our victim status with people. I've been victimized more than you. I have it way worse than you do. We compare in almost every conceivable possible realm of life. We compete, we compare, we compete, we compare, and we're constantly evaluating, am I winning or am I losing? Am I winning or am I losing? If I'm winning, I'm arrogant. If I lose, I'm envious and jealous. So jealousy and envy, it fuels competition. Number two, jealousy and envy fuels discontentment. It fuels discontentment. Why are we so discontent? I mean, we have so much in our country. Why are we so discontent in life? Well, it is often because our hearts are just filled full with jealousy and envy. We want what other people have. We want and 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 we want. It is jealousy and envy that make it impossible to enjoy what we have. The issue is not what we have. The issue is that someone has more of it than we do. Or someone has something that is newer than us, or nicer, or better. And when we look at that, and then we look at what we have, what we have suddenly becomes insufficient. And we do it in every area of life. We do, that's just, we are, we are hardwired to do this. Cars, jobs, wives, kids, houses, everything, we do it because our hearts are wicked. In one sense, Saul should have been so happy. Consider what he was facing. He was outmatched on the battlefield, the Philistines. They have a warrior, a giant, that they don't know how to get past. And then all of a sudden, God brings about this young man, this brave, courageous, great, humble leader who leads the army of the Israelites to victory. And David is on his team. David is on Saul's team. But Saul is not happy about it. The entire nation is celebrating, but Saul is not happy about it. Why? 
because he's competing. He feels discontent because he's losing the competition battle. Look at verse eight says, it says Saul was furious. No celebration in a soul. Saul was furious and resented this song. So there is anger, there is resentment, and then he is complaining. There is complaining in his heart when he should be celebrating. And so it is joy, I'm sorry, it is jealousy and envy that drains the joy out of our lives. One commentator said it's, it's like jealousy and envy, they poke holes in our heart that drain all the joy out of it. It is jealousy and envy that makes us discontent with what we have. And a discontent heart does all kinds of crazy things. It is fueled by jealousy and envy. Jealousy and envy, number three, fuels every kind of evil. It fuels every kind of evil. We know his heart is angry. He's resenting David, or he's resenting the song, and he is complaining in his heart, but it doesn't stop there. Verse nine says, so Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. So, so now he has a jealous eye. He, he is putting a pair of glasses on, jealousy and envy, and it is, these glasses are gonna skew everything that he sees. He's watching with a jealous eye. And reality is about ready to be skewed. And as he looks with his infected eyes, his corrupt eyes, what will he see? Well, this is what he sees. Verse 13, or verse 12. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had left Saul. So what does he see? God is with David and not with me. 13. Therefore, Saul sent David away from him. He can't even be in the same presence as David. He can't be around him because it's so clear God is working in David's life. Saul sent David away from him and made him commander over a thousand men. David led the troops and continued to be successful in all of his activities because the Lord was with him. When Saul observed that David was very successful, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was leading their troops. So how does he respond? He's afraid. This guy who's on his team, he's afraid of him because of his success. He does not love David, though he should love David. See, to love, you want to know what love looks like here? To love is to rejoice in the success of others. That's what, it, when you're loving a person, you're putting your happiness in the happiness of others. You're saying, I'm going to be happy when you're happy. I want you to do well. I want God's blessing in your life. I want you to succeed in life. That my happiness is in your happiness. To love is to rejoice in the success of others. It is to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. This is one practical way love plays itself out in our relationships. But jealousy and envy is to weep with those who rejoice. That's what it does. So David is succeeding and Saul is terrified. He is not rejoicing. It's driving him mad. Jealousy and envy is to weep with those who rejoice and to rejoice with those who weep. That so oftentimes in our hearts when we're competing with other people, we're competing with our siblings, we're competing with our spouses, with our coworkers, with our friends, we compete with other churches, with other ministries. And see, it is jealousy and envy inside of us that makes us celebrate at the downfall of our rivals. So when other churches go down, when other leaders go down, when other ministries go down, the part of us that says, yes. I'm so sorry that happened, but inwardly, yes. That is jealousy and envy in our souls. Os Guinness says, envy enters when seeing someone else's happiness or success, we feel ourselves called into question. That the success of others causes us to question our own legitimacy, our own significance, our own worth, our own value. And so instead of rejoicing, Saul is competing with David. And when you compete with other people, it destroys your relationships. You young men here, a lot of you, you're close friends. You're close friends. You're, you're tight-knit. And your lives are getting figured out. 
And jealousy can pollute all of those relationships. That when others begin to do better, they get into relationships, they get better jobs, they have more success in ministry. Jealousy can plague all of those relationships. Same is true with you young ladies. Tighten it close, but what will happen over time is that as things change, you're going to rate yourself and compare yourself with your friends. And it will pollute your relationships. It destroys relationships. James 4, what causes the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? Which evil desires, James, are you thinking of? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it from them. And this is exactly what's going on in our country. Our country is fighting for power. Our country is fighting for popularity, influence, money, status, respect, reputation. This is what our country is doing. And, and our country is doing this because it's hardwired in us. This is the natural course of our lives. I, I remember years ago, with one of my sons, he was three, three years old, uh, we were watching some NFL, the NFL playoffs, and we were talking about the su- Super Bowl. And after he was learning about the Super Bowl, I remember he's, he's three years old, he just looked at me and he said, Dad, when I grow up, I'm gonna win 10 Super Bowls. Like, he was so confident. Like, I'm gonna win 10 Super Bowls. And I said, that's good, son. That's great. Good for you. And then I thought, just out of curiosity, I said, son, why do you wanna win 10 Super Bowls? Like, what are you thinking, little three-year-old boy? Why do you wanna win 10 Super Bowls? And he says, Dad, I just wanna be better than everyone else. I just wanna be better than everyone else. And I said, thank you for your honesty, son. Your heart is obviously wretched, uh, but, at least, <laughs> but at least you're honest here. And you don't grow out of it. You don't grow out of it. It's in you. And there's a more arrogant, boisterous, loud personality type where envy is maybe easier to see. And then there's a quiet type, a a more reserved type where you're not as boisterous. But I know the truth. Envy's in your soul and it will light your parachute on fire. James 3, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Now, Now mark this. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. It is jealousy and envy that fuels every kind of evil. And this is what we see with Saul, the jealousy of Saul. Verse 9 says, so Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. The next day, an evil spirit sent from God came powerfully on Saul, and he began to rave inside the palace. David was playing the lyre as usual, but Saul was holding a spear, and he threw it thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him Twice, So an evil spirit sent by the Lord to Saul, likely as punishment for Saul's rebellion. And what we see is that Saul is being driven mad. And that is what jealousy does. It, it will drive you utterly insane. Jealousy, jealousy is demonic. It is unspiritual. It is earthly. It is destructive. And it will drive you mad. And so it says that he's in a rave. And that word means he's in a babble. That's what it means. He's babbling. He's blah, 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 blah. He's just like, he's, he's, his mind is crazy. And what the writer of 1 Samuel does is brilliant, is that he connects two thoughts that need to be connected. And it's a little bit difficult to do in English, but when you look at the original language, it comes shining through. And so the question is, as Saul is raving and he's out of his mind, what is he thinking about? Like, what is, he, what is he doing? He's, he's babbling, he's raving, he's mad, he's upset. What is he thinking about? Well, the writer of 1 Samuel wants to connect these thoughts. How does he do it? Well, look at verse 7, 1 Samuel 18, 7. As they danced, the women sang, Saul has killed or slain. It is the Hebrew word nakah. 
Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And this is the thing that's, that, that sets Saul down this direction. It's the song. And then you see him raving in the palace, and he has a spear in his hand. That's a bad combination. Demon possessed possession and a spear in your hand. This is bad. And he throws it. He throws the spear at David to kill him. What is he thinking? Thinking, I will nakah David to the wall. That's the word. So the image is that Saul, what's going on in his mind is the song. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul has killed his thousands. The song is playing in his mind. It is stirring him up to more and more jealousy, and then he takes the spear and says, let's talk about Nakah here. I will Nakah you to the wall. It is driving him mad. He is attempting murder. And see, in reality, there's no reason for David and Saul not to be friends. There's no reason for them not to work together. David has done nothing wrong. He's done nothing against Saul. The problem is the jealousy and envy of Saul. And once Saul starts down this path, the path of jealousy, it is so hard to recover. And let me tell you why it is so hard to recover from jealousy. Like, why doesn't he just snap out? Why doesn't he just snap out of it, Saul? Saul, just get your act together. Snap out of it. Why doesn't he do it? Well, let me tell you why. There's a lot of reasons. But one is that jealousy and envy hides itself. It hides. It's, it's, it's in the deeper part of the soul, meaning you do not commit jealousy. You do not commit envy. You commit murder. You lie. You commit adultery. You do not commit jealousy and envy. And so the way we experience jealousy and envy is not through jealousy and envy. You don't experience jealousy and envy. What you experience is something different than jealousy and envy. And what Saul is experiencing is anger. But what's underneath his anger? Jealousy and envy. He's experiencing fear. But what's underneath his fear? Jealousy and envy. He's experiencing resentment and grief and discouragement and hatred and murder. Murderous thoughts. But what's underneath it? jealousy and envy. And so what we experience will be grief, disappointment, anger, fear. But the true issue, not always, but often, is that we're jealous. We're envious. And so it goes undiagnosed in our souls. We try to medicate our fear and our anger and our resentment and our grief where the deeper issue is jealousy and envy, and it leads to utter chaos. It leads to utter chaos in our lives, and you see it so clearly in Saul's life, verse 16. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was leading their troops. Saul told David, here's my oldest daughter, Merib. I'll give her to you as a wife if you will be a warrior for me and fight the Lord's battle. So here's the religious covering. You see the religious covering? King of Israel, the people of God, the nation of God, let's go fight the Lord's battles. But Saul was thinking, I don't need to raise my hand against him. Let the hand of the Philistines be against him. He says, there's a law of numbers here. Keep sending David out to fight the Philistines. Eventually, he's going to die. Eventually, he's going to get a sword in his belly. Then David responded, who am I? And what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? And that plan is foiled by David. Then in verse 20, he tries again. Now Saul's daughter, Michael, loved David. And when it was reported to Saul, it pleased him. I'll give her to him, Saul thought. She'll be a trap for him. And the hand of the Philistines will be against him. So Saul said to David a second time, you can now be my son-in-law. Saul then ordered his servants, speak to David in private and tell him, look, the king is pleased with you and all his servants love you. Therefore, you should become the king's son-in-law. Saul's servants reported these words directly to David, but he replied, is it trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law? I'm a poor commoner. He says, don't you know who I am? I don't have any money. I can't pay the bride price. Verse 24, the servant reported back to Saul. These are the words David spoke. 
Then Saul replied, Say this to David, The king desires no other bride price except a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. But what are his true motives? Actually, Saul intended to cause David's death at the hand of the Philistines. And when the servants reported these terms to David, he was pleased to become the son, king's son-in-law. Before the wedding day arrived, and so we're going to see David's bachelor party. So if you guys are looking for a biblical bachelor party, <laughs> just one idea for you. <laughs> Before the wedding day arrived, David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented them as full payment to the king to become his son-in-law. Then Saul gave his daughter Michael to David as his wife. Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved him, and he became even more afraid of David. Here it is. As a result, Saul was David's enemy from then on. And for the rest of the book of 1 Samuel, we're going to watch David run away from Saul. Motivated by jealousy and envy. And here's the truth. All of us here, we struggle with it. We struggle with this. So the question, how do you cure it? What is the cure to jealousy? What is the cure to envy? Here it is. It is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. The first thing love is not is that it is not jealous. If you act in love, you will not act motivated by jealousy. And what we have in this passage is a remarkable example of self-sacrificing, other-centered love. This is what we have. And so we got to go all the way back to the beginning of the story, verse 1. When David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship. This is before the celebration and the song. And loved him as much as he loved himself. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I want to be really clear about something. I have not done probably the appropriate level of research on the thing I'm about ready to say. So I'm going to throw a caveat here. Okay? Caveat. I believe Jonathan is the only person in the Bible that it is said of a person that he loved someone as he loved himself. There may be another example, but I certainly cannot think of it. That command is given over and 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 over again. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jonathan, to my knowledge, is the only one who is credited with loving another person as he loved himself. This is an incredible demonstration of love. Verse 3 says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as much as himself. And so he loves him as much as he loves himself. And this is a very interesting Hebrew phrase. He loved him as much as he loved himself. It's the Hebrew word bromance, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking, it's not the word. But this is what it is. It is this deep relationship, friendship, where you come alongside of one another. And this is what Jonathan's doing with David. He says, David, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I will have your back. I will have your back. I will be your friend. I will be lo loyal to you. And it is a covenant of friendship. And what makes this so remarkable is that if David is a threat to anyone in the story, it is Jonathan. Jonathan is the rightful king. He is the rightful king outside of God's plan to anoint David. He is the one before the anointing of David. Jonathan is the rightful king. He is the one who is to become king of Israel. And Jonathan knows it. And next week, we're going to see that Saul says, don't you know about David? He might take your place as king. And so what Jonathan does in verse 4 is this. It says, then Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, this is no ordinary robe. This is the royal robe. And in the book of 1 Samuel, the robe is connected to kingship. You see it several times, that the robe is connected to kingship. So this is the, the robe of the prince, 
the king to be. And when he takes off his robe and he gives it to David, he is giving up the kingship. He is giving it up. It's not mine. I will not be king. You will be king. And what is produced in Jonathan is not jealousy and envy. It is self-sacrificing, humble, other-centered love. Then Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. And what he is saying to David is, David, you will be king. I will not be king. You will be king. He recognized the plan of God working through David and not himself. And when he offers up his military tunic, his, his sword, his bow, and his belt, he is saying, this belongs to you, and now I serve you. Jonathan is almost certainly older than David. Uh, some people say he's at least five, six, seven years. Some people say it's more like 10 years older than David. Jonathan had been serving in the military, fighting all of these battles, <clears throat> but Jonathan recognizes the hand of God. He trades places. John, Jonathan, in essence, trades places with David. And he does this to his rival, in theory. They're not rivals. But in the mind of Saul, they are rivals. And so this is what he says. This is what Jonathan says to David. He says, my life for yours. My life for yours. I'm give, you have it. Like I'm giving this up so you can have my life my kingship, my spot. Saul was saying to David, your life for mine. You will die so I can be king. And the rest of 1 Samuel is about this pursuit of killing David so Saul can remain king. And so in Saul, what we see is the natural way of jealousy and envy, competition, rivalry, anger, resentment, bitterness, complaining. He's lighting his parachute on fire. But in Jonathan, we see a way of love. We see a way of self-sacrificing, other-centered love. And this is where this passage, or at least one place in this passage, where we see Christ. That Jonathan is a picture of Christ. That Jesus is a much better Jonathan. Philippians chapter 2 says this. So if you're looking for application points, we're about ready to start. <laughs> Look at verse 5. Let me ask you a question real quick. Are you a Christian? If you are, you don't have an option not to obey this. You have to do this. So don't look at it like, okay, if I want to, or it's kind of hard. No, no, no. Say, my hope is you say, God, by your grace, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, the the the, the the grace of Christ has given us this. Now, what is it? Verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, to be thi to, <clears throat> with God a thing to be grasped. And so what, it, what he's saying is that Jesus is God in the flesh, truly God, truly man, and he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Verse 7. But emptied himself. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so the path of Christ is not the path to fight and to claw to get to the top. The path of Christ was to come underneath everyone to become a slave of all and die even for his enemies. That, that he emptied himself. But see, we will never obey this command, the command to become a slave of all, to empty ourselves, to love one another as we love ourselves. We will never, we will never live this way. We will be plagued by jealousy and envy until your eyes see Christ. That at the cross, 
Jesus took off his royal robe of righteousness. That's what he's doing. That the God, not just the king of Israel, the, the, the king, the rightful king of all, the king of kings, took off his royal robe of righteousness and exchanged it for our guilt and our sin and our wretchedness our shame and he took it from us and then he was crushed for us at the cross why so that we can become like him so that we can be clothed not with an earthly robe but with the royal robe of righteousness we will never live this way until our eyes see that our lives are truly only satisfied in him until we're, until we're convinced that our lives are found in him, that we've been created for him, that life is found in knowing him. We will never live this way until you see Christ looking at you and looking at your sin and looking at your guilt and looking at your wretchedness and seeing the Lord Jesus say, I will die for you so that you can live. He says, it's my life that I give for yours. And see, when our souls taste that type of love, that type of mercy, that type of grace, we are humbled. When you, when you walk in the reality of the grace of God, we are empowered to live this way. We're, we're empowered to not live according to jealousy and envy, but rather we can look at one another and say, I will offer my life for yours. I will not compete with you. I will root you on. I will serve you in love that my happiness is found in your happiness. I place my happiness in your happiness, my joy in your joy. You're not happy, I'm not happy. You're weeping, I'm weeping. You're rejoicing, I'm rejoicing. See, when our eyes are on the Lord, sin loses its grip on our souls. And so what is the cure for jealousy? It is tasting the grace of God. It is tasting the, the grace of God and learning to walk in love. And this is the type of community we want to be. So what's our goal in our community groups? This is one of them. We want unity. We want friendship. We want the type of community that abounds to the glory of Christ, that gives testimony to the gospel of grace. That's what we want. But we can't do it because of our jealousy and envy. So the solution is grace. We look to him. We love him. We put our eyes on our Savior. And as we do, as we meet with him, as we see him, as we obey him, as we trust him, as we seek to love one another, as we love ourselves, we're transformed. And I'm telling you, this is our hope. This is, all what it, this, this is our hope. You can, there's no place to put your eyes that will free you from jealousy and envy. There's no, where are you going to look? There's no place to look. There's one place to look. And it is, it is in the emptying of Christ, the King of Kings. It is in the humility of Christ. It is in the love of Christ that we see at the cross that changes everything. So look to him and seek to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the example we have. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're not just an example, that you are the Savior of the world, that you're, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that you are the one who came for us to rescue us from the dominion of darkness, to, to free us from the power of greed, from the power of lust, from the power of jealousy, from the power of envy. And I just pray for the saints here this evening that we would look to you. We would follow your example. But we can't do it, Lord, so help us through your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.